So would you like to start with your questions? Okay, great. Is this on? Oh, it is on, okay. All right, well, it seems that I'm a minority voice here on this panel, which is not always a bad thing. Um, but I think that um, the reason I think that APAC is good for Israel is because I think that Israel could not have gotten away with being Israel. There could not have been this brutal apartheid regime in Palestine had it not been for APAC. And the brutal apartheid regime is what Israel is. There is no other form of Israel. There is no possibility for any other type of an Israel. And this kind of leads into the first question here that I have, a uh, comment regarding something that, well, I guess two questions are, are pretty much uh, complementary. Uh, uh, this is regarding to a comment that my father made in a speech here in San Francisco in 1992, when he was still alive, saying very similar to what uh, Gideon was saying, that APAC or the American blind support and financial aid to Israel is um, is corrupting Israel because free money corrupts. But I don't think that that is what corrupted Israel. Israel was corrupt from the beginning. Israel is the, was, was created as a result of a brutal ethnic cleansing and established itself as an apartheid regime immediately when it was formed. There was no better Israel. There was no uncorrupt Israel. There cannot be an uncorrupt Israel because it was built on a crime and it has no legitimacy. So the possibility that something else corrupted it and that perhaps it could have been better without this, I don't think that's a possibility. And APAC is the enabler, absolutely. APAC is the enabler, or maybe one of the enablers. But I don't think that the, the financial support is what corrupts. It feeds the corruption, but it was built on like I said, a crime of, of terrible crime of ethnic cleansing and brutality, which goes on to this day, perhaps even worse than it was. And then the second question, I'll just kind of connect, so I'll connect the two, uh, which is this whole idea that we could have an Israel next to a Palestinian state living in peace. You cannot have an Israel next to a Palestinian state because Israel is a racist colonialist state that is built on a racist colonialist ideology which cannot be reined in. There cannot be an Israel and a, and a reality where there is some other you know, rights for Palestinians within it. There could only be a state that affords rights to all of its citizens, regardless of whether they're Israeli or Palestinian, or an Israel, which is a racist regime. These are the two options. An option where we have two states, one a, one a Palestinian, one Israeli, is impossible. It's science fiction, because you cannot pull in, you cannot rein in a racist, colonialist regime. That's why it hasn't happened uh, you know, uh, to this day. So that kind of ties in, I think, with uh, the, both of these questions tied in. And that's why I, a single democracy or a transforming of Israel it, from, a, from what it is today, the so-called Jewish state, into a, a democracy with equal rights is really the only solution if we're seeking justice and peace and if we want Hawaida and her, and, 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 and her children to be, have the same rights as my children, who were also born here in the United States and have completely different uh, status when we, go, when we go to visit Palestine. So that's it, thank you. Can I get one hour because I have here? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> I will not be able to answer all the questions. I'll be happy to answer them privately later because this will really take uh, so long. Let's call it from now on the United States of Israel. Because many times when someone looks at the relations between Israel and the United States, one might ask who is really the superpower between the two? And those questions become much more valid in the recent days when you see what's going on with Iran. And really, I, I'm not in a position to tell Americans what to feel, but when would I be an American? Like I asked the uh, old Barack, would, I be, would you be a Palestinian? Would I be an American? I would really be embarrassed. When you see a title in Haaretz, in my newspaper, which says two days ago, Israel to pressure Congress to thwart Iranian nuclear deal. And then an Israeli official says Haaretz, 
that Israel will lobby the US Congress to pass legislation that would make it difficult or even impossible to improve comprehensive deal with Iran. Can you imagine yourself if it would be the opposite, if someone would have written that the Americans are trying to, to act in the Israeli parliament to change its decisions? I mean, we are dealing now really with almost questions of sovereignty. We are dealing with really needless to say that this no state in the world would have dared to do it, and no statesman in the world. And I must tell you frankly, it's not Israel's fault. Israel is doing whatever it can. It's the one who enabled it. Now, there were some questions about Haaretz and about uh, myself. This is always easier to answer. Uh, Haaretz lost like uh, one million shekels, which, was, uh, which is around uh, $300,000 only for my uh, article about the pilots in terms of uh, canceling subscribers. <laughs> and still Haaretz supports me and I gain full, full freedom and Haaretz found a way to survive even in those bad days. And uh, um, we, have even, we have now paywalls as part of you know, and it's a great success story relatively. And we are struggling like any printed uh, newspaper in the world except of India. Uh, in all other parts of the world, the printed newspaper are struggling, but for the short coming time, as far as I know, we will be there, if the Israelis will want it or not, we will be there, and I'll be there as much as I can. Uh, why was Netanyahu re-elected? How come that Netanyahu was re-elected? The one million dollar question. <laughs> uh, that exactly shows what I try to say, uh, where Israel is, is going. But Netanyahu is an artist of spreading fears. He reminds me of this child in the Charlie Chaplin movie, who went and threw stones at windows of shops, and then came his father to fix those windows. So Netanyahu threw the stones, and then he calls his father, which is himself, to fix it. He spread all those fears, not only Iran, not only that all the Palestinians want just one thing to throw us to the ocean. Even swine flu can become an existential threat in Israel for a few days. He spread all those fears, and then he presented himself as the one and only one who can save Israel from those terrible threats. It's a very well-known method to survive politically. This man never suggested one single hope for Israel. One single hope. There are politicians who build their career on hopes, many times false hopes. He went in a different way. I was last week in Canada. There is a twin to Netanyahu in Canada. <laughs> Mr. Harper also, you know, I, I thought when I was in Canada, I felt so much at home. I mean, <laughs> they have this obsession now with ISIS that in a certain stage I told my partner, let's not go out from the hotel because they are everywhere here. <laughs> and Harper is elected again and again and, and I never met a Harper uh, supporter, I never met a Netanyahu supporter, but by the end of the day, they are re-elected, and that's the secret, I guess. I'll try one more question. Uh, what pressure you face to stop you from your writing? Uh, th this must be very clear. I mean, I get a lot of hate mails. I'm, I'm really not the story. But until now, at least, I gain freedom in terms of my newspaper, and also, one must say, in terms of the government, it is not to be taken for granted. In the last war in Gaza, there was one very serious politician from the Likud party who called to bring me to court for treason. Treason in war, in war by the way, in Israel might be death penalty, which was never implemented, obviously. But those voices become stronger and stronger. But until now, the only pressure I really face is those unpleasant things from the street from the Jewish community. The other day, someone wrote me, thank you for a wonderful article, Adolf Hitler, and things like this. Very tasteful 
I passed long time ago the wishes for my death, now it's cancer to my children, and uh, these kind of things. It's not very pleasant, but it's really not the issue. The issue is where does this place go to Israeli society? You know, the best thing when we try to confront those right-wingers, those Zionists, those mainstream in Israel, the best thing is not to argue with them. The best thing is only to ask, where do you go to? What is your plan? There are no Palestinians, nothing. It's only Israel, chosen people, everything. Where do you direct? What will be in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time? You really believe that this will be possible forever? And there will be no answer. And my last remark, what you just mentioned, Miko, we can do a whole lecture out of it. Me, like you, I truly believe that the two-state solution is dead. I think that this train left the station. I, to I deeply regret it, but it left the station. I think that all those who speak now about the two-state solution do so deliberately only to gain more time in order to base the occupation even deeper and deeper. Thank you. Okay, I had a, a comment, a couple of comments, uh, and it's very true. This one says, please, when talking about Arab Palestinians, please include Druze too. It's not only Muslims and Christians. And that is very true. When I said Christians and Muslims, I did not mean to exclude Druze, very much Druze, Bedouins, all Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel. And there is another question along that line that said, um, in regards to um, in, in regards to Arab, well, this one says Arab Israeli citizens or Palestinian citizens of Israel, would a Druze experience the same discrimination? Does the Israeli government discriminate among the Arabs living inside Israel, such as Druze, Christians, and Muslims, or are they treated equally? I don't have any hard facts about this or statistics. It show, for the most part, they're treated. Uh, I mean, they're treated equally. They're not Jewish. Of course, the Druze community, as, as most probably know, um, serve the, in the Israeli military. And so therefore, they are eligible for some things, some perks that come along with serving in the Israeli military that those that don't serve in the Israeli military um, aren't eligible for. But also within the Druze community, it's not 100%. It is split probably around 50-50 in terms of those who serve and those that don't. It's an internal debate uh, within the Druze community. And I know I have a relative that who is Druze who refused to serve in the Israeli military. He uh, was going to be a doctor, and he was thrown in jail. He served his time in jail and could not later pursue that. Uh, he could not become a doctor because of the fact that you know, he feigned some kind of uh, insanity to get, uh, not necessarily insanity, but um, some reason why he could not serve in the Israeli military. But he was allowed to become a politician. And he was, uh, he is currently uh, a politician. Um, so there is, you know, that special circumstances of the Druze actually having to serve in the military because of an agreement that their uh, religious leader made with the state of Israel. Uh, when the State of Israel was founded, but many, many Druze uh, refused to serve. Uh, as far as, I think also, although this is unsubstantiated, it's not backed by any kind of you know, empirical evidence, but I think that it is a little bit harder for Israel to do some of the things to the Christian community that it sometimes can get away with doing to the, to the Muslim community um, because of, so, because Israel tries to paint itself, you know, as a victim mainly of Islam and Muslims, and to paint Islam as the, you know, kind of global enemy, and Israel being a safe haven for Christians. So if you hear about, you know, Christian homes being demolished in mass, that wouldn't look too good for Israel. And so in terms of maintaining that kind of public perception that it wants to maintain to keep itself as the victim, I think the uh, level of uh, discrimination when it comes to 
Uh, a lot of outright things are the, are the same. Like I talked about uh, the, the communities that can decide who lives and who doesn't live within certain communities, and this discriminates against all non-Jews. Uh, since the founding of the State of Israel, Israel has established over 600 uh, communities and municipalities Jewish, not one for any Palestinians, Christian, Muslims, or Druze, or otherwise, none. This kind of discrimination is the same. But when you talk about the Bedouins and Israel move, and having a plan to move large-scale numbers of Bedouins uh, out of their communities or to demolish homes, not only in the Negev, but also in Lid, uh, these are mainly Bedouins, Muslims. Uh, and so I think that there's that little bit of a, a distinction there. Sorry, I went on for too long that question. There's, um, do you read Haaretz? What is its reputation inside Israel? Um, I do sometimes uh, read Haaretz, not, not religiously, but it's, its reputation inside Israel, it's the left-wing newspaper. Uh, it's still it's the Zionist left newspaper. I think uh, Gidon talked a little bit about how they lost um, some followers, but it is seen as the very lefty. It's not the mainstream newspaper. Um, and so take that uh, as you will. And I think the last one that I have time for is, can you describe what needs to be done to raise the massacre at Darius Sin, uh, April 9th, 1948? So yesterday we did just commemorate the massacre of, of Darius Sin. And I'm not sure what the question is as to, to raise up, but if, if it is to make it more well known, uh, I think that one of the things that we need to do is to document and commemorate these massacres are ongoing. Um, you know, after Der Yassin, just last summer and before, we're talking Gaza, and I, I, I fear there probably will be more. But we need to do what I think we're doing right now, uh, documenting, so very important, not forgetting, continuing to commemorate, and joining also political action to make a change. So another plug for something that you, every one of us can do in our own communities, and that is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, because that is having a tangible effect on Israel that is scaring the bleep out of Israel in that it is mobilizing its forces to fight that because, because Israel is afraid of delegitimization. And the only reason they can continue doing what it's doing is because it spends so much trying to legitimize their actions. Um, and when we work to turn Israel into that pariah state that it is until it starts, until it dismantles its colonial apartheid system, um, that, is, that is what we all need to do. And it's so, you don't have to go over to Palestine, you don't have to get on a boat to Gaza, you do it with your, in your own community, your own union, your own home. And that is giving me hope for change. And so for Der Yassin, for all the other massacres that have happened and, and I fear might be, we will not forget. And I, I truly believe that these victims will get justice one day. Thank you. Thank you. So we're running a little late, but you wanted to say one more yeah, thing? One final remark, really final. Many times people tell me, look, the United States is like an aircraft carrier. It takes time to move its directions. And you must be less impatient because historical changes take time. And you should look at it in terms of history, of decades, of generations. And I must remind all of us that by the end of the day, we are dealing with the third generation under the occupation, with the fourth or fifth generation ever since the State of Israel was established. Those people deserve also something. Those people deserve dignity and freedom, and they don't have time to wait until this aircraft carrier will change its direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our panelists are wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And we'll have the next panel come and...